Greetings and welcome back, people of Middle-earth. It's your boy Kamal once again. Why is there an I in that cosine function? Is that clickbait? Well, technically speaking, yes, it is, but it's the cool kind of clickbait, so... Yeah, this is gonna be a nice integral to evaluate. But why is there an I in the cosine function? Well, the way we define the cosine function in complex analysis is cosine z equal to e to the iz plus e to the negative iz over 2. And although everyone loves trig functions, I have noticed that there isn't much love shown to the hyperbolic trig functions. So if we transform from z to i times z, we get cosine iz equal to e to the i squared z plus e to the negative i squared z over 2, which gives us e to the negative z plus e to the z over 2, which is the hyperbolic cosine, or the cosh of z. So, yeah, the hyperbolic trig functions do deserve some love because, well, they're pretty cool versions of the circular trig functions. I mean, cosine of i times z, that is pretty damn cool. Anyway, so now to restate the integral in the manner in which it, it was intended to, that's the integral from 0 to infinity of log x over cosh of x plus 1 dx. And this is a pretty interesting integral to evaluate. But to evaluate it, we actually have a side quest first. We're going to evaluate the integral function i of some parameter alpha, defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha minus 1 divided by cosh x plus 1 dx, where the alpha parameter is defined to be greater than or equal to 1. Yeah, that should work out quite nicely. And the reason for that is if we differentiate partially with respect to alpha, x to the alpha minus 1, we get x to the alpha minus 1 times log x. So this implies that the derivative of i with respect to alpha equals the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha minus 1 times log x divided by cosh x minus 1, terribly sorry about that, plus 1, dx, where we've invoked the Leibniz rule. And it's pretty easy to justify the switch up of the integration and differentiation operators using something like dominated convergence. So yeah, that's a bit of homework for you guys. Anyway, so this is what you get on differentiating. And if we plug in alpha equal to 0, we do indeed get the target integral. So that means the target integral i is in fact i prime at 0. So that's the plan. We figure out a closed form for i of alpha and differentiate that closed form to get the target integral i. So it's basically a solution development where we're trying to figure out a Mellon transform and then apply Feynman's trick to evaluate the target integral. So yeah, that is indeed quite cool. But how do we evaluate this thing? Well, I just showed you what the hyperbolic cosine function can be expanded as. This can be expanded as e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. So I'm going to write i of alpha in that manner. So we have integral 0 to infinity, x to the alpha minus 1, terribly sorry about that, divided by e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2 plus 1 dx. And now would be a good time to expand using a factor of 2 to get rid of that in the denominator. So we have twice the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha minus 1 over e to the x plus e to the negative x, terribly sorry about that, plus 2 dx. Now what exactly was the utility of all that? Well, notice that the denominator can now be written as a whole thing squared term. So we have twice the integral from 0 to infinity of what exactly? We have x to the alpha minus 1 divided by e to the x over 2 squared plus e to the negative x over 2 squared plus 2 times e to the x over 2 times e to the negative x over 2, which means we have 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the alpha minus 1 divided by e to the x over 2 plus e to the negative x over 2 whole thing squared. And now I would like to factor out an e to the x over 2 term from the factor in the denominator. So we have x to the alpha minus 1 divided by e to the x over 2 times 1 plus e to the negative x squared. Wait. 
that's where the square is supposed to be. Okay, cool. So that means we have twice the integral from zero to infinity of x to the alpha minus one over e to the x times one plus e to the negative x squared. And it would be nice to expand using e to the negative x. So you have exactly that term in the numerator now being multiplied by the x to the alpha minus one term. And downstairs you have one plus e to the negative x squared dx. And this is pretty cool because now we can apply a geometric series. Recall that one over one plus x can be expanded as the sum over k from zero to infinity of negative one to the k times x to the k provided that the absolute value of x is less than one. And here we can replace x here by e to the negative x, which is clearly less than one on our interval of integration. So we have one over one plus e to the negative x equal to the sum over k from zero to infinity of negative one to the k times e to the negative k times x. But notice something that we needed this thing squared so I could differentiate this thing, or I could just differentiate the geometric series itself in this more general form, if that's what you want to call it. So differentiating it once gives us one over one plus x whole squared, where the two negative signs, wait, 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 do I have two negative signs? No, I only have one negative sign because of the power rule. So that's negative one over one plus x squared. And this thing equals the sum over k from zero to infinity of negative one to the k times k times x to the k minus one. And of course, because of this k equal to zero term, we just have a zero, so we can start the sum at k equal to one instead. So we have negative one to the k times k times x to the k minus one. And of course, we could expand using negative one, which yields one over one plus x squared equal to the sum over k from one to infinity of negative one to the k plus one, which is of course equivalent to negative one to the k minus one times k times x to the k minus one. And now we can replace x here by e to the negative x. And that yields this thing here on the left hand side. And on the right, we have the sum over k from one to infinity of negative one to the k minus one times k times e to the negative x times k minus one. So that's e to the negative kx plus x. But also notice that we have an e to the negative x term being multiplied. So we could expand using this term. And that gives us e to the negative x over one plus e to the negative x squared equal to the sum over k from one to infinity of negative one to the k minus one times k times e to the negative kx, where the e to the x and the e to the negative x terms cancel out on multiplication. Okay, cool. And now it's time to return to our integration problem. <coughs> this implies that i of alpha equals the integral from zero to infinity of x to the alpha minus one times this term over here for which we now have a really cool infinite series expansion that is the sum over k from one to infinity of negative one to the k minus one times, terribly sorry about that, times k times e to the negative kx dx. And now we can multiply this thing inside because it's independent of the index variable k. And we'll switch up the order of the operators to get the sum over k from one to infinity of negative one to the k times k times the integral from zero to infinity of x to the alpha minus one times e to the negative kx dx. One thing I would like to address is in a lot of my videos, I actually take time to justify the switch up of the operators involved, like the differentiate, or like the derivative and the integral operator or the integration and summation operator. But it's become so repetitive and at this point so trivial that I think it would be a better learning exercise if every time I do this, I just ask you guys to prove it as an exercise. I mean, yeah, a bit of research. And these things are relatively trivial, especially at this stage. Anyway, so what exactly was I talking about? Yeah, we're about to evaluate this integral. And how on earth are we gonna evaluate the integral? Well, for this thing here, I'd like to let k times x equal t 
and this implies that dx equals dt over k. So the limits of integration are clearly not bothered, and we have i of alpha equal to the sum over k from 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the k times k times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the alpha minus 1 over k to the alpha minus 1 times e to the negative t dt over k. So the k terms do cancel out quite nicely, and we have the sum over k from 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the k divided by k to the alpha minus 1 times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the alpha minus 1 times e to the negative t dt. Okay, cool. This is our good old pal, the gamma function. That is gamma evaluated at alpha in this case. And that thing is independent of the k variable, so we can take it outside the summation operator. And we have gamma of alpha times the sum over k from 1 to infinity of, I think I missed a factor with a negative 1. Yeah, I forgot there's a negative 1 over here. It's k to the negative 1 here, k to the negative 1 here, and k to the negative 1 over here. Terribly sorry about that, although I'm pretty sure that some people have already commented on it. Anyway, so we have negative 1 to the k minus 1 divided by k to the alpha minus 1. And this thing here is another very special function. It's the Dirichlet eta function evaluated at alpha minus 1. Okay, cool. So this implies that I here, I think I'm missing another factor. Believe me, I am. Yeah, I forgot this factor of 2. I was pretty sure I was forgetting something. I'm not referring to my notes today, just for the fun of it. Yeah, really no good reason to neglect my notes. Anyway, so we have 2 times gamma of alpha times the eta function at alpha minus 1. And that's i of alpha. So that's i of alpha, but there is one revision I'd like to make because of the fact that we're using the series representation for the eta function, which is valid for a positive argument. In that case, I need alpha minus 1 to be greater than 0, implying that alpha should be greater than 1, which means I should revise the domain for the integral function I assigned earlier. So we should have alpha here being greater than 1, and what have I done? Only now am I correcting it. And the target case would be alpha equal to 1, but this should be regarded as a limiting case. What I'm trying to say is that the target integral would be the limit of i prime of alpha as alpha approaches 1 from the left. That is what would make actual sense over here. So that means I can now differentiate this thing and get terribly sorry about that, i prime of alpha equal to 2 times gamma prime of alpha times eta at alpha minus 1 plus 2 times gamma alpha, terribly sorry about that once again, gamma alpha times eta prime at alpha minus 1. And now evaluating the limit as alpha approaches 1 of i prime of alpha, that gives us the target integral. This thing equals 2 times gamma prime at 1 times eta at 0 plus 2 times gamma at 1 times eta prime at 0. Now, what exactly are the values of gamma prime and eta prime? Well, gamma prime at 1 is the negative Euler-Mascheroni constant, and eta of 0 equals 1 half plus 2 times gamma 1. Now, gamma 1 is just 0 factorial, which is 1, so we have 2 times eta prime at 0. And I do have a video evaluating this thing, which I will link in the description box. This thing is 1 half of the logarithm of pi over 2, which does indeed look quite nice. So we have some cancellation of the factors of 2 here, meaning that we're left with negative gamma plus the logarithm of pi over 2, which is a pretty gorgeous looking result indeed for the integral from 0 to infinity of log x over hyperbolic cosine of x plus 1 dx. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Do drop me a follow on Instagram. And in case you like the effort I'm putting into my videos, consider supporting me on Patreon. Thank you. See you next time.